All right, here we go. Let's get into slideshow mode and let's have, well, a slideshow. <laughs> Here's the vocab list number four for this AMSCO list that all of grade 11 is using right now and whoever else is using it in the future. So let's go over this week's words. Some good ones that have a little bit of complication to them, some different connotations, kind of a lot to talk about. We've got genteel, phobia, dysphagia, brazen, marine, cajole, unsavory, zenith, sublime, amoral, biopsy, and malignant. And I realized this morning when I was starting to record that you can see all these books behind me. So I thought maybe I would feature a book. That would be a cool thing. This one is our featured book today. 28 Artists and Two Saints, a collection of essays by Joan Acasella. I love Joan Acasella. I was inspired for this one because a lot of my students right now are trying out for the dance team. Joan Acasella is the premier writer about dance. Uh, she's a dance critic and a general critic and literary critic for the New Yorker and, and other publications. If you're interested in the history of dance, which I actually really love the history of dance, um, that book is worth checking out. Stuff on Fosse, about um, Twyla Tharp, about the great ballet dancers through history. Really, really cool, interesting stuff about choreography and the tradition of dance. And really just, I mean, beautiful stuff about art and so on and so forth. Worth reading. Collections of essays. So they're short and you can, you know dip in and out of it as you see fit. This is maybe, is a bit of a genteel topic for us. Genteel is an adjective. It means polite, refined, or respectable. Some people can say in an affected or ostentatious way. We're kind of getting more vocab words here. Ostentatious is like really above and beyond doing it so everyone notices you're doing it, right? That's being ostentatious. It's being excessively polite. Picture people in uh, movies that take place in like the 1700s, right? How people behave in the company of kings and queens, how they behave in society, mm, hello, spot of tea, mm. like how we picture the English. It's basically genteel. Now, the word is associated with class and social status, and to a certain degree, wealth. It's seen as something that wealthy people do. It's a manners system. As such, someone can say it and not necessarily mean it's a compliment. They can mean that it's a uh, kind of snooty, right? There is something to this of genteel behavior was a way to distinguish between the social classes. There are people who would behave in a genteel fashion, those who could kind of learn the manners, which fork to use and things of this nature, how to behave, how to curtsy, how to bow in different situations, things like that. The manners, the actions of it. But it can also be a pretty high compliment, right? You can say that someone is mannered and sophisticated. Oh, they're very genteel. They know just what to do in a given situation. It kind of depends on where you put your value set on manners and behaviors. Someone can be an excellent person and be a rude, boorish person at a dinner table, you know, a sloppy eater and all the rest, and not know the rules, but they're still a great person. And simultaneously, someone can know all the rules and be, well, kind of a jackass, right? Kind of a jerk. So tone and context are going to be important here, but ultimately... To, to be genteel is an adjective. Gentility would be the noun here, is to behave in a way that is mannered in a customary traditional way. A phobia. A phobia is any extreme or irrational fear or aversion of something. Now, it's not just being afraid of something. It's being really afraid of something. Oh my God, get it away from me. I can't even be around it, right? Now, many people have some sort of phobia. Heights, the dark, small spaces, certain creatures. I have a phobia of reptiles. I don't like being around them. I, like, I need to get away from them. I work on overcoming my phobias. That's not an easy thing. Now, it's usually seen as a part of another word, right? If you see the word phobia attached to something else, that other thing, whether it's a Latin or Greek root, is the only thing that they are afraid of, right? Uh, is it a triscodophobia? It's the fear of the number 13, for instance, right? Uh, if you have, um, agoraphobia. You're uh, scared of, uh, wait, agoraphobia is the one where you're scared to go outside, where you want to stay inside all the time because you're scared of the outside world. Things of that nature. Now, dysphagia is a noun. It's a medical term. You're not going to use it a lot outside medical uh, situations. It means you have difficulty swallowing. It can be certain foods or drinks, or it can be difficulty swallowing in general. You have like whatever, uh, anything that's a certain consistency is hard to get down something of that nature. It's not really used outside of medical stuff, and you're going to use it much in your daily life. But when you use it, well, it's going to matter. It means you're, you know, having a pretty hard time. Now, brazen. Doing something boldly and without shame 
especially if that action is kind of a questionable choice, like maybe it's not moral, it's not ethical, it's not legal, it's not wise, it's not polite. If you do it all the way, really boldly, like in front of everybody so they all see it, that's a brazen action. A criminal can perform a brazen act if they do it without trying to hide it, right? You don't go rob the bank in the middle of the night. You break in while everybody's there and have them lay down on the ground. That's a brazen act. You are in class and you decide you want to cheat. You don't suddenly have the answers written on your hand or something. I don't have them written in my hand. You know, you don't like subtly do it. You're just like, Rip, I got them here. I'm going to read them. I got them. There's my answers. It's a bookmark. I don't have answers for anything. It's a bookmark from a good bookstore in Denver called the Tire Cover that I used to work at. Anyway, that's brazen to do it boldly without care that other people are seeing it, maybe even showing it off a little bit. Marine. Now we're talking about relating to the sea, relating or in uh, a result of the sea itself, right? Um, marine creatures are creatures that live in the ocean, right? That live in the sea. We're not talking about the Marines, the military, the, the soldiers, right? Marine in this context is anything that's related to the ocean. A marina, right, is a little area that you park your boat in to go off into the ocean, things of that nature. So if you see marine, marine life, marine plants, you're talking about things that relate to the ocean. Now, cajole, this one's a little bit tougher. To cajole someone, it's a verb, is to convince someone to do something with sustained Coaxing or flattery. Coaxing is like a, trying to like convince them. You just don't let up. To conjole someone, you keep asking and you keep asking and maybe give them some compliments along the way. That's the flattery part. Oh, you're very handsome. I know I asked you before about if I could retake that test, but maybe you'll let me retake it now. I mean, this is my favorite class. I wouldn't want to have a bad grade in my favorite class. Are you asking someone on a date? Don't, don't control someone for dates. If someone, if you ask someone on a date and they say no, don't ask them again. They already said no. All right. Respect people's boundaries, it's really, really important. The idea for this being, if you continue to ask, if you cajole your family into giving you permission to go do something, you keep asking, keep asking, go to that party, to have a later curfew, to get an allowance, whatever it may be, and you try to wear them down. That's cajoling them. Cajoling is not a positive thing. It's seen as like a, a sneaky to a degree. It's, it's not honestly getting the answer you want. It's manipulating someone into getting the answer you want. It ain't great. Unsavory. Now, unsavory is interesting because it's kind of changed in how we use it day to day. If something's unsavory, it's disagreeable to taste, smell, or in appearance. Uh, it can also mean being disagreeable, being unpleasant, because it's morally disreputable or repugnant. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like at the bottom of our pictures here, we have like old fashioned food from the 60s where everything went, uh, 50s, where everything went into jello molds. Pretty gross. So you'd have like olives and hot dogs and spaghettios served cold together. <laughs> oh, God. Horrible. Go through some old cookbooks. You'll see some really nightmare stuff. Whereas on the right, we have Steve Bannon, who's the definition of unsavory for me. He's a terrible, terrible human being. And he looks like he's a terrible human being. Like he's awful. Um, if you see that man on the street, don't trust him. He's a bad person. Now, foods can be unsavory if they seem gross and unappealing. Ironically, or not ironically, but oddly, the word savory does not mean good. Savory in food kind of means good. Really, it means um, uh, it labels the flavors that are not sweet or spice or anything else. When you think of like meats or breads, those are savory flavors. Uh, so they're good, but they don't fit in the other kind of categories. Unsavory is just without any kind of good, pleasant taste. Now, confusingly, particularly when you're talking about a person being unsavory or an unsavory idea, just a thing that's bad to be around, that's dangerous, untrustworthy, unsavory often has an extra U in it right after the O, unsavory. Now, this is from the English spelling, but it has kind of like crossed over in funny ways. So you'll see it with both, not on the quiz, but in life. Now, Zenith. The time at which something is at its most powerful or most successful, the point at which it is at its top, at its peak. The word is almost interchangeable with peak, right? The top of a mountain is its zenith, right? The furthest point away that a star is from us when our, you know, rotation, right? That when a celestial sphere is directly above you, right? That is its zenith. Um... People can use the word more figuratively, though, to talk about their greatest achievement. 
I was at the zenith of my career when I, whatever, got the award for best blah, blah, blah of the blah, 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 right? The zenith is the absolute highest point of achievement. Incidentally, there was an electronics company when I was a kid called Zenith, which I always thought was a cool name for an electronics company. I didn't even know what it meant. I just thought it sounded cool and futuristic. And I found out what it meant. I was like, oh, even better. It's supposed to be the best that there is. It's the peak. It's the highest of that thing. Sublime. And we got to use Sublime a little bit carefully. Something sublime is of such excellence, such grandeur, such beauty that it inspires awe. Right? The word awesome used to not just mean, oh, really cool. Awesome used to mean it inspires awe, an overwhelming mag recognition of magnificence, right? Magnificent, not necessarily good or bad. A nuclear explosion would be awe-inspiring. Oh, I can't believe what this is. It, it overloads my senses. It's something that's, now, in terms of sublime, it's something that's so powerful that it takes your breath away. It actually touches at your innermost being the idea of meaning, okay? What it is to be alive. Now, the problem is it gets overused. We have examples here of an amazing meal. Oh. Is an amazing meal sublime? I don't know. Like, that'd be quite the meal because it's a meal that would make me question my existence. Literary history is filled with the idea of sublimity, which is the noun form. There's a whole movement in poetry and literature of trying to approach the sublime, right? The romantic poets were all about this. Think of like Walt Whitman, things like that. Um, Coleridge. It's an idea that's existed for a long time, transferred from one movement to another. Um, the sublime is trying to find an image or an idea or a line that would connect on a soul level with the nature of what it is to be alive and connected to the universe. The sublime is an enormous idea. If something is sublime, someone's beauty is sublime. Someone's voice is sublime. Someone's uh, painting that they did, a view. It is connecting us to what it is to be a soulful human being. It's an enormous thing. But unfortunately, people do sometimes, oh man, I went and saw that thing. It was sublime. I had that meal. It was sublime. Uh, <laughs> they use it that way, but they kind of shouldn't. All right. I'm not saying they're amoral if they do that, but I don't agree with them if they do it. To be amoral is to lack a moral sense. Often when you have the prefix a, it is saying opposite of what comes after it. Okay. So the lack of moral sense is to be amoral, to be unconcerned with what is right and wrong. I don't care what the right thing is to do. I don't care what the ethics are. I'm just doing it because I'm an amoral jerk. A person can be described as amoral if they don't care about being a good person. They don't care if what they're doing is considered right or wrong. Actions can also be amoral if they are done and conceived in a way without any regard for what is right. It is amoral to cheat. It is amoral to hurt others, to hurt their feelings, to hurt them physically, whatever else it is, right? We know it's the wrong thing to do. An amoral person does it anyway. Now, hopefully it doesn't result in a biopsy. My God, a biopsy is purely a medical term. You're not going to hear it in other contexts. It's, the, it's an examination of tissue removed from a living body to discover or understand the presence, cause, or extent of a disease. Usually it's if you have like a tumor or something like that, the doctor or the practitioner will insert a hypodermic of some kind and withdraw a sample. It's a it's a, not literally a hypodermic, it's a, it, they, they use a, like a hollow needle to withdraw, to remove, or they might go in and scrape it out. They're getting a piece, a sample of that mass, and they're testing it to see on a cellular level what it's all about, okay? So they might take and remove a small sample of the tumor, of the patch, of whatever's going wrong, to examine it and run some tests. The biopsy is the removal and the running of tests. It's all of the above. Now, hopefully, after your biopsy, it does not turn out to be malignant. Malignant is an extremely virulent or infectious thing that spreads harm, often disease. Now, when we talk about malignancy, we're generally talking about disease, but not always. Malignant can also be used to describe a person or an action. Okay, a person can be malignant, aggressively tainting and ruining things around them. If so, if a if a 
cell is malignant, it's going to spread its kind of, think of it like its messaging system, its code, right? Of, if I was better at medical stuff, I could explain this better. I understand it, but it's hard to explain. The genetic code that is causing it to grow this tumor, that's causing it to grow in a way that it should not, it will transmit that information, so to speak, to cells around it and cause them to also corrupt and grow in this thing it's not supposed to be. It will ruin what is around it and spread, right? It will spread this illness and potentially kill you, right? Which is why doctors go after malignant cells. They cut them out, they shrink them with chemo, all the rest. A malignant person is one who goes into a situation and actively makes it worse. We have those people in our lives. We see them in our classes. They go in and they spread ill will and make things worse for everyone around them. Now, funny enough, if you're looking up images for malignant, it's a while until you get to cells. You're going to see a lot of stuff for the James Wan film, Malignant, that came out a couple years ago. Now, I won't ruin the twist of that movie, although it was already ruined in the movie Basket Case. Malignant is actually like an uncredited remake of Basket Case across, across a movie called Society. I don't know what you guys have seen. They're all body horror movies from the 80s um, that I'm obsessed with. I love that stuff. But anyway, the idea in the movie is it's a good name because in Malignant, the body horror aspect of it is about a, a biological threat that spreads ill will towards others and about a character who spreads ill will and ill actions toward others. Even some ideas can be malignant. They poison those around us. Election denialism is a malignant idea. It's bad, it's damaging, and it spreads and creates more damage throughout society. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the slideshow. It's a long one. We're at 17 minutes. It's the longest one we've ever had. But the words this week were a little complicated, and they had a lot of nuance to them, and I want to make sure that we found ways to make them clear for all of us. All right, I'll see you next time. Bye.